We have the saying that we are not from Norway, we are from Bergen. Absolutely historic, folks. He has done an amazing job. Come in and demolish the course record. There's one thing to lose because you're a weaker performer, but if you lose because you choose a bad tactics, then you just beat yourself up because tactic is so easy to do something with. It's just like a matter of choice. The most important factor is nutrition and enough sleep. Being these outliers, outsiders, nobody's really paying attention to what you're doing. And this is over 10 years in the making. Your 2022 VinFast Ironman World Champion is Gustav Eden. Hey everybody, welcome to the podcast. Well, today we're in for a treat. We've got a couple Vikings in the house. The Norsemen taking over the world of triathlon with ferocity. Their names are Gustav Eden and Christian Blumenfeld. And between these childhood friends and constant training companions hailing from Norway, there is no stone left unturned and no championship left unconquered. In an unprecedented period of just nine months, Christian was crowned Olympic champion in Tokyo. He recorded the fastest Ironman performance ever in his debut at the distance in Cozumel. He became the first person to go under seven hours at the 140.6 distance in the Sub-7 project, clocking an astonishing, assisted, yes, but still astonishing six hours and 44 minutes. And he also walked away victorious at the 2021 Ironman World Championships in St. George, Utah. On the other hand, hot off an absolutely spectacular debut victory at the Ironman World Championships in Kona, a race in which Christian placed third, Gustav Eden, who happens to be the 2021 70.3 world champion, has now definitively emerged from Christian's formidable shadow, smashing the overall Kona course record with a blistering seven hours, 40 minutes and 24 seconds. Also rewriting the marathon course record with a two hour, 36 minute and 15 second, 26.2 along the way. Personally, I was absolutely glued to the Ironman World Championship live stream all day on October 8. It was a barn burner of a race in which Christian and Gustav raced in tandem until the very end. And it was an absolute thrill to host both of them in studio literally just two days after the epic race, the details of which we cover extensively in this conversation. We also discussed the nature of their unique training protocols, what a day in their lives looks like, the extreme science and data mining that underscores their training and racing protocols, as well as their advice for amateur athletes and more. In other words, how do they do it? Why are they so much better than everyone else? And what the heck is going on in Norway anyway? Final note, if you dig this vibe, I also recorded a separate podcast with their coach, Olav Alexander Boo, who is a bit of a mad genius. And that's an amazing conversation that we will be releasing on a future undetermined as of now date. So there is that to look forward to. Anyway, waste further precious seconds. We will not. The Norwegian train is in the house. So uh, let's uh, tuck into that arrow position hammer some watts and enjoy. Welcome guys, I'm so excited to talk to you. How are you guys feeling? Uh, right now, I'm extremely tired. <laughs> My cords are not good, <laughs> Yeah, but I'm, yeah, extremely happy, Uh huh. satisfied. And combination of hangover and just <laughs> lack of sleep and uh, yeah. I asked you guys if you were able to sneak in a little partying after the race, but no, right? You had to get on a plane and get to LA. Yeah, so we went to the banquet afterwards, but that's just more like an award ceremony, so mm -hmm. no party. And uh, yeah, went straight to bed and came here. Came but, here, your bikes didn't make it. But I can't see what, like how people can even stay awake. Like <laughs> you've been out, like it was getting up like 3.30 in the morning and then racing the whole day and then, uh, when the evening is coming, I'm just so, so tired. Yeah. Maybe they're saving themselves for the after party and that's why not winning. 
Maybe. <laughs> that after we'll party is probably going on right now, yeah. <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> well, I'm delighted that uh, you've carved out time in your busy schedule uh, to sit down with me. It's just a treat uh, and an honor to talk to you both on the wake of such an extraordinary race. But before we even kind of get into any of that, I need to remind you that the most important thing is that merely a year ago at the Malibu Triathlon, my relay took both of you guys out. And <laughs> really? that is what is important today. <laughs> Do you remember that's that? True, that's true. <laughs> Did you win over us? I don't think we won. Maybe, did you guys win? I know yeah, we beat Christian's I, team. I Who was on your relay? It uh, was me, uh, Kassan Burgand, and uh, one of the actors from uh, some dozen. I, I can't remember the name. Maybe you guys, did you guys win the relay? I think we won. Right. Or at least we came on the podium. I think we got That's second sure. or third. I can't remember. I had yeah, I think Alexi Pappas yeah. and Mary Kane on my team. Okay. Think anyway. We just outside. Just outside. Yeah. yeah. Priorities, right? The Malibu Triathlon <laughs> that Celebrity Relay. That was a fun one. <laughs> um, listen, you guys, what you both have accomplished together separately is is absolutely mind blowing. Um, obviously, the big story uh, is Kona the other day, a race in which all the barriers were broken, all the records were smashed, and mostly by <clears throat> rookies. Like of all the men in the top four, they were all rookies, right? Ironman uh, Hawaii rookies, at least. And uh, Gustav, you broke the previous cor course record set by Jan uh, Ferdino back in 2019, absolutely destroyed it. Christian, you were third, but you're coming off an Olympic victory, the fastest ever Ironman you know, ever recorded, the sub seven project. I mean, between the two of you guys, there is uh, no record that has been left untouched. And uh, it's it's really an extraordinary feat. So here we are days after Kona. And I guess, you know, I asked you how you're feeling, but have you had a moment to kind of reflect back on the race with some perspective on what this means and kind of what it's setting you up to do next? I just felt like I've been mean, walking from selfie to selfie and media request to media request. So yeah. I haven't really had the time to sit down with uh, yeah, Ola, my coach, and Christian to do a bit more analyzing and yeah, really see how we we did. So uh, yeah, I don't think I realized uh, what I've done yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we have two different uh, feelings about the race because obviously both of us sure. wanted to win. And uh, so I like when we flew in here yesterday, like when I was listening to music, the only thing I was thinking about, like, why didn't I win? Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. and then what could I have done differently? And uh, so I've had a little bit of time to reflect, uh, but it's just like in the back of the mind. Right. So obviously uh, unfinished business for you, Christian. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, you guys grew up together, you've known each other forever. You do all your training together. There is this camaraderie, this friendship, but also a rivalry. And, you know, all eyes were on the both of you running together, you know, through the latter part of the marathon, who was gonna break away and when was that gonna happen? And most of the spotlight has been on you, Christian, because of your past performances. Gustav, you haven't yet had, you hadn't yet had that opportunity to really kind of flex and, and shine. You missed that opportunity in St. George by being sick. Um, so this was really your moment. Did you have the confidence going in that you could accomplish this? Are you surprised or, you know, how are you feeling about kind of emerging from, you know, I don't want to say shadow in a pejorative way, but you've always been sort of uh, a little bit, you know, behind Christian in terms of attention and expectations, even though you won the 70.3 world championship and all the rest of the, uh, your accomplishments. Yeah, so I don't think I link uh, my confidence to past performance that much, and especially not to uh, media attention. So uh, back in 2019, I looked at myself as a favorite to win the to win the 73 World Championship, even though basically no one uh, thought I could do it. So yeah, for sure, I, I thought I could uh, win this race. Uh, as I said, me and Christian training together and we know where the level is at. Mm -hmm. And I felt really strong and especially the run lately. So I knew I had a, a really good chance of beating Christian in a race. And I knew if I, I was beating Christian, the, the reigning world champion, then uh, I think I would beat everyone else as well. 
Yeah, and and this rivalry that you have, are you still buddies? Like, you guys cool with each other? You got to spend all this time together. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's like, it's a, I would say a quite cool dynamic because uh, in training we try to build each other build each other up as much as possible and really get the best out of every training session. But it's on race day, it's uh, it's the same up to a certain point where you're trying to. Uh, you're working yeah. together. Yeah, you're working the race together, but you also you want to beat him, but you also want him to perform. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, I yeah. Fe- I felt we had like a moment there on the way back from Harvey when Magnus have had the penalty. Yeah, and we had Sam Laidlow up front. Yeah, even though we didn't believe he would be able to run, <clears> and then we were like, maybe on both understanding now. Okay, now it's actually just a race between you and me. Yeah, mm-hmm. but then still we can't let Sam get away, and we can't get the guys behind just to catch up. So we still have to right. work together. Yeah, so and it's a really um, interesting dynamic, I have to say. Yeah, also, there was a lot of teamwork on the bike and on yeah. the run. I mean, I noticed coming out of every aid station, you would swap who would lead. Like there was a lot of like cooperation there until it's sort of coming out of the energy lab and then it's anybody's game, th- right? That, that wasn't really collaboration. <laughs> that was wasn't okay. I, I, so I tell made me him. what was going on. <laughs> yeah, so, me. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I went to the lead and had a lead, um, yeah, for, for most of the run. Uh-huh. But I didn't want to, uh, it's one thing to lose because you're like a weaker performer. But if you lose because you choose a bad tactics and that you could done differently and then won, then mm-hmm. you just beat yourself up because tactic is so easy to do something with. It's just like a matter of choice. And if I had run up to Energy Lab in the front in the headwind the whole way and Christian would take me like the last few uh, Ks, I would be so, sure. so, so mad. Sure. So, so you're I, like, I your turn, to, you get in front but, but now. Yeah, I tried to make him go to the front as well. That's just a, to, uh, yeah. That's upside and downside why training so much together. Like, because I knew that he was coming in in great run shape. And if I wanted to have a chance to beat him, I couldn't share the work with him. Mm-hmm. I had to really, yeah, play my card right. And yeah, so every time... Yeah, we both tried to play our cards. Yeah. It was just that, that they didn't match up. So uh, <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting because you know each other's cards. So there's yeah. no secrets, right? Yeah, but I was a bit uncertain because, uh, yeah, Sam Laidlow, way up front, he still had like four minutes mm-hmm. uh, or 3.40 uh, after, I don't know, 20K or something. And uh, I knew that I had to run quite fast to catch him because it was no sign of him blowing up. And I had my brother on course and he said, Sam is actually looking good. Right. And yeah, no sign of him blowing. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to catch him, obviously, but also didn't want Christian to just sit behind and wait for, for a sprint. Right, for you so to do So I all made the work. him go to the front, but every time he went to the front, he was running, yeah, not slow in like the general slowness, but quite a bit uh, slower than uh, what I was running when I was to the front. So we were actually losing a bit of time when he went to the front. Mm-hmm. And I thought that uh, this guy is playing it so cool now. He is, uh, yeah, doing like this insane mental game, trying to get me to work the whole way. (laughs) But uh, I realized that soon we were fighting for a second place and none of us wanted only second place. So then I had to make my move and yeah, go after it. Yeah, I mean, it was interesting uh, seeing Laidlow up front for so long and the expectation being, of course, that he would blow up. He's a rookie, he's so young. It's just a matter of time. You guys are gonna you know, eat this guy alive at some point. And yet he continued to maintain that gap, uh, you know, kilometer after kilometer and even into the run, right? It, so at some point you realize like, we gotta make a move probably earlier than we would have ordinarily because this guy might make it to the finish line. Like it becomes, uh, you know, a matter of how much real estate you have left. So. I know in a, you know, there was an interview with you, Gustav, there was some sort of smack talking between the two of you guys, Christian, you were like, well, I've been beating Gustav in training for the last two weeks, handily, this is gonna be no problem. And you were saying, yeah, but you know, he doesn't know I'm holding back, wait till <laughs> the last five miles, but you made your move at, I think with like eight miles to go. Yeah, so my plan was always to really kick it after Energy Lab. Mm-hmm. Uh, we developed a new shoe together with uh, On, and it's been a really, really cool project. And that shoe oh, is okay. just- You got the plug in, the no, sponsor this, plug. This is, yeah, it's, <laughs> I'm working up to the, uh-huh. to the point now. Right. So, but the you shoe- You got some media training in you? 
<laughs> the shoe is it's made for the, like the faster bits, like downhill and uh, tailwind. It's just perfect for those conditions. So out of Energy Lab, I was struggling a bit, was going uphill. And so you did struggle. Yeah, but Christian also had a gap on me there. <laughs> so uh-huh. I thought he was just playing with me. No, when I, I had did a gap. also, but I, I did lose. You guys haven't bit. talked about this yet? Not, not too much. We're going from media, <laughs> yeah. media to media. So this is the first time we have to lay it all down. So you get the, you get the fresh uh, conversation. I appreciate now. that. Yeah. Keep going. Um, but yeah, he had a gap on me there. And I knew that he knew that he had a gap on me. And normally when you have a gap, that is where you try to accelerate a bit to just mm-hmm. break the rubber. But uh, yeah, he didn't do it. So then I knew how he was like kind of on the limit. So I out did. of Energy Lab, I just accelerated and, right. and went for it down yeah. the hill. And when you made that acceleration, you knew you had to gap him like with force, right? Rather than just sort of slowly pull him along. Like you had to just break the chain. For Christian or for Sam? For, for Christian yeah, to yeah. get that gap. Yeah, and then to eat up time so that you were sure you were going to pass Sam in time before the finish line. Yeah, at that time I was more worried about Sam actually because uh, he was still two minutes up the way and mm-hmm. no sign of slowing down. But I I ran a, like a period there I ran a three minute case in the in the marathon. <laughs> It's it was it was downhill, but uh, still. So what I was is just, that? I was just looking, mile pace like five thirties or something. Quicker. I have no is idea. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know five. you guys do kilometers. Yeah, um, insane. Like when I, my my kind of overall takeaway just from watching the race is that it's just at a whole new level. Like I'm used to seeing, um, you know, people blow up on the run, and even the best, like walking at times or throwing up and having GI issues, all that stuff that you know we've all seen over the years. And this just looked like a sprint from start to finish. Obviously, you had incredible conditions. There wasn't any wind. Um, so it's not a say, surprise. That, that's that, a lie. What's that? <laughs> that's it, a lie. It didn't look like it. I mean, these bike splits are unreal. <laughs> yeah, but it was still was wind, but the wind was, uh, it was quite favorable. It wasn't like insane conditions, but it was good. And especially on the run, I felt like it was a lot of wind, mm. especially going out. Yeah, that uh, was a lot of headwind. Did yeah. you get some overcast late in the day or no? Uh, no, not, it, it was in the start. Right in the beginning of the yeah. month. Yeah. yeah, but, but also the wet. start was like earlier this year. Didn't you, you guys started in the dark basically, which is unusual. Uh, 625. Yeah, yeah, so maybe that, I don't know. Yeah, me neither. First, first time is we don't know when they Yeah, we're rookies. Yeah. Rook, we're rookies in Ireland. But nobody's blowing up, nobody's walking, nobody's vomiting. Everybody is so dialed, like even through transitions, everything, like the execution was flawless. So the competition level is just, you know, beyond anything that we've ever seen. I mean, it's crazy. Like even, um, I mean, Keenley had like an unbelievable race. Was that his fastest time? Yeah. And he was way back there, you know, it's like he yeah. didn't even, fifth or something like that, I think. How many uh, guys sixth, broke the yeah. bike course record? I think- uh, it was only Laidlow who broke the bike course. Yeah. Well, maybe Cam were Cam no. I think Cam like nine. a bunch of you. Well, Cam's record was like four oh nine. I think right. Mm, okay, and we did four eleven. I thought oh, you did. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I thought a whole bunch of guys. Yeah, but, it was, but the overall record, plenty of people did. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. But ten guys on the eight hours that like is just like for five years ago that was like the course record as well. Right. So the whole field has been just improving and getting mm. faster and. I guess getting more knowledge about how to really race a full distance Ironman and not just finish it. Right. Because often there has been, uh, yeah, the last survivor who's going to win, and now you really have to be able to be tactical and really push that last bit and race it. Yeah, you, there, no mistakes. You can't make any any mistakes and expect to win. Um, one of the things about Kona, this race in particular, and and the Big Island is sort of the mystique around it, the spirituality of the island, the mana, you know, uh, not ruffling the feathers of Madame Pele. And I know Christian, you're like, I don't have time for that. Like that's a bunch of nonsense. Uh, but having not achieved your goal this year, are you rethinking that? Are you gonna Are you gonna get down on your knees for Madame Pele a little bit? <laughs> you know, like Mark uh, Allen talks I, a lot about this I, and it I took did. him seven years and it wasn't until he kind of like, 
had a reverence or, or like a humility for the forces of that very special place that he was able to conquer it and win. Maybe, maybe I should have put a lava rock in his bag. Yeah. So he left. <laughs> never to, yeah, <laughs> like that. Yeah, the worst <laughs> omen for people that don't know, like never remove a, a lava rock from the no, island. I think uh, like I did still had a decent performance myself. So it's not like I blew up and walked in NG Lab. Mm-hmm. So uh, I don't think it was the mystery of the island that did that I didn't win. So yeah. of course, I'm um, like watching those, um, the videos from his finish shoot and like seeing all the people there and it's really a uh, race. I do want to cross the finish line first and uh, I do have to come back and experience that feeling. Yeah. Yes, it was amazing. Yeah, it was, uh, it was amazing. And uh, I actually spoke uh, to Mark a bit about it. So uh, it's, if, uh, as a winner, you have to have a speech mm-hmm. at, the, at the banquet and ask him, what, what should I say? And he said that um, I should give more credit to the island and less credit to my lucky hat. <laughs> So I have, yeah. I have so like, what did you say? Did you take that in? No, no. no? no. He's speaking some wisdom there. <laughs> you should ponder that. Do some journaling around that idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, you you said after the race, like uh, I don't know if I'm coming back. Like one and done. Is that how you're feeling still? I wouldn't say one and done, but I would come back first thing. Mm-hmm. Um, for now, it's all about Paris Olympics for me, mm-hmm. 2024, and. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's hard to keep your priorities straight when uh, you have so many opportunities and you have so many things to do. So I think for now it's better to just say no and uh, try to focus only on Paris. Right. And Christian, reflecting on on the race and your performance, are you thinking about how you can improve? What went wrong? Where you can make changes? Like where where is your head at? You're not used to you know coming in third. So what is this, what's going on inside that brain? Well, now it's more like to understand why I was struggling so much to keep up with him on the run. Like if it was because of the surges on the bike or if I was just not good enough in the run training before. Uh, But it's difficult to have like a pure answer to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, yeah. Back in the lab with Olaf. You're just questioning yourself like all the time and uh, you just feel like, okay, really have to come back. <laughs> yeah. Well, you seem like somebody who is motivated by these sort of circumstances. I think uh, I'm getting more motivated by this. Yeah. <laughs> like finishing third and I'm by winning races because then it's just back in the mind and just, yeah, it's like painful the whole mm-hmm. for weeks afterwards. And uh, luckily now we have another race in St. George in two and a half weeks. Start two and a half weeks and uh, that's more like, okay, I can get my revenge there and use that to kind of forget this race a little bit. Right. I mean, typically after a race like Kona, most athletes would take a break. In two weeks, you have 70.3s, no break for you guys. And that's an interesting amount of time. Like you can't really do any buildup. You've got to recover from Kona. All you can do is really uh, sort of rest and sharpen the edge of your sword a little bit, right? But, like, But it's not just that we have St. George, we have the following week we go back again to Olympic distance for the mm-hmm. Bermuda race. And then three weeks later, we have the grand final. So we've been through all the different distances. It's like, a, this <laughs> is like season. mid-season for you. Yes. So yeah. uh, I think we use three, four days more of recovery. Yeah, from and now, then, yeah. And yeah. then uh, maybe some intensity for the weekend and then trying to dial in some speed again for right. shorter distance. Right. All right. So... You guys are known as the Norwegian train. Everybody is fascinated by what's happening in Bergen. I'm gonna talk to Olav after I talk to you guys and we can dive into the science, but I think people are fascinated by and interested in like what it is that you guys are doing that's different. Like, why are you so good? Why are you so fast? So can we talk a little bit about your approach to training and what has distinguished you guys from what everyone else is doing? Uh, I think it's uh, people talk like what's in the water in Bergen or mm-hmm. something, but I think it's it is slightly random that we have that many good athletes from Bergen, but it's definitely a culture thing. So uh, me and Christian, we have been yeah, basically in love with training for 
yeah, 15 years. Yeah, like since you guys a, were like 13 pretty, years old, at right? At a high 12. level. So even uh-huh. before that, we did a lot of training, but uh, we have been, well, I see myself as a, as a professional since I was basically 14 years old. I was training better than, than some pros do today. Mm. So I think it's been a lot of volume, high quality training for many, many, many years that has made us into the athletes we are today. And it's not some, yeah, I don't know, higher power. And I guess we've yeah. also been living in this bubble like within the group and not just looking at what everyone else is doing. But we like, if we want to catch up, we have to be more extreme. We have to train more. We have to uh, take it like one step further in every uh, part of the sport. And I think also the fact that we've been like in that bubble has really helped us to yeah, just uh, accelerate. Right, kind of being these outliers, outsiders, yeah. nobody's really paying attention to what you're doing and you could kind of go deep um, when the stakes were low and there were no expectations and you know, find a certain kind of groove that ultimately is paying dividends. I mean, this is like over 10 years in the making. And also no history now. in the sport. So mm-hmm. Because we had right. no history, we had to make the pathway ourselves. So we haven't just been following someone uh, yeah, and uh, if you're known for being the ones who train the best, the ones who train the most extreme, it's kind of like a positive feedback loop. So since everyone's saying is, yeah, you're training the best, you're smartest, so scientific, you kind of uh, grow into that even more. And that makes you think, okay, we have to do everything more, have to do everything more scientific. So it's for sure, it's good to be known to be good because then you think uh, yeah, you're good as self. So I think it's something about that as well. Well, I see it as a confluence of all of these factors that you couldn't have predicted. Like you have, you you're, you come from a cycling background originally, right? And Christian, you come from swimming. Swimming, swimming. believe it or not. Yeah, <laughs> no, I can believe it. Um, at a time when uh, Norway hadn't put anybody on a triathlon Olympic team for I don't know how long, ever maybe? I, had there been yeah, never. never before. Uh, but suddenly you have uh, an interest in Norway for truly developing a professional approach to the sport um, with, what, what was his name? Arid Tveiten? Arid Tveiten. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, I'm, not, I'm never <laughs> going to pronounce that right. And th- who came into the picture around 2011 and then with Olav entering around 2015, 16, um, observing what was going on at the uh, Rio Olympics and then bringing a whole level of new professionalism um, and science into the approach. So it's like these individuals who kind of come together with athletes like yourself and Casper, of course, uh, who are highly motivated and willing to go all in, like without any one of those elements, none of this happens. So it's kind of a really special thing. I think of it as sort of like, um, like, like Bergen and triathlon is not dissimilar culturally from like what was happening with grunge music in Seattle in the nineties. Like it's a, it's like a special place where there's an energy uh, and a focus that, you know, ultimately over time, you know, ripples out and creates something really cool and unique. And I think also the fact that when we started so young, we had this uh, 10 years vision within the team. Uh-huh. Uh, so when we were 16, 17, we had, it wasn't just that we should be, uh, winning the junior world championship the next year or getting into the uh, yeah next world cup. We did think like 10 years ahead and we had that support and uh, believe and understanding that it's like a long journey right. that we're having ahead of us uh, when we started back in 2010, 2011. And I think we got support from the Olympic TV team even in 2014 and not just for Paris, no, I mean for um, uh, Rio. Mm-hmm. But, or not just for Tokyo, but also for Paris back in right. so 10 years ahead. And that long-term vision, I think, uh, has been good to have like behind us. It's so important, that long-term view. Like we're not gonna be, you know, world champions overnight. We're gonna take, we're gonna look at this in 10-year blocks. And we're thinking way, way down the line, like for anybody who's trying to achieve any kind of goal, like having that kind of lens and, you know, building the foundation and the consistency over a huge period of time. I mean, that's truly how you achieve outdate, outdate, out, outrageous, audacious results. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we've done 
a lot of things right over the years, but we have also learned a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think the way we approached it in the start was a bit too extreme for for many of the athletes. So Christian said it's uh, the egg uh, philosophy. Egg philosophy. So you take the whole basket of eggs and just throw uh -huh. it at the wall and then see who who doesn't crack. You weeded out a lot yeah. of people early. So, so how many of are how many are there of you now on the team? From the start, we are four. Yeah. So we haven't compared to like bigger nation, we haven't burned through too many yeah. really. Mm -hmm. We but have. we had uh, quite a few dropouts way in the start because uh, yeah the volume was a bit high and a lot of injuries and yeah. But that's also because we didn't have any qualification standards. It was more like we op open up the door so everyone who wants to come in, like if we were just thinking about triathlon, you could come in and be a part of the first camp that we had. So I think yeah. it's also down so, to uh, that. So back then uh, I, I went there with my brother. And one of the, the main guys in triathlon Norway, he said, those Eden brothers, they will never learn how to swim. They will never become anything. <laughs> he have uh, like said that uh, he regret those words and he's a really a cool dude, but uh, it's a bit funny looking back now. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> the ultimate revenge you, yeah. you've had on that. <laughs> but he didn't hilarious. actually say it to me though, so that's good. Right. Sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll be right back with more awesome, but I wanna snag a moment to talk to you about the importance of nutrition. The thing is, most people I know actually already know how to eat better and aspire to incorporate more whole plants, more fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily routine. Sadly, however, without the kitchen tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. So because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly and because I want everybody to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. The solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of highly customizable, super delicious and easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery and you get access to our amazing team of nutrition coaches seven days a week and many other features. To learn more and to sign up, visit meals.richroll.com. And right now for a limited time, we're offering $10 off an annual membership when you use the promo code RRHealth at checkout. This is life-changing stuff, people, for just $1.70 a week, literally the price of a cup of coffee. Again, that's meals.richroll.com, promo code RRHealth for $10 off an annual membership. All right, let's get back to the show. Let's talk about the particulars of, of the training and the data mining that you guys are doing. I mean, I think, you know, most people who are who are in the endurance world or who have participated in triathlon or Ironman kind of understand lactate testing fundamentally or zone training and periodization. But you guys have taken kind of those traditional approaches and just elevated it to a whole new place. Like I think you're 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 doing like lactate pricks like multiple times throughout every single session, doing multiple sessions a day, seven days a week. Like what, what exactly, like dispel some of the mystique here. Like what, walk me through like what you're understanding and I'll, I'll get deeper into it with Olaf, but from your perspective as athletes, like what are you doing when um, you're doing all this testing and how is that impacting your approach to training, recovery and racing? Yeah, so uh, it's not that we do lactate on every single session, but it's some periods we really have uh, more focus on it. And uh, we do lactate both to like calibrate your own feeling of intensity control. So um, it is, uh, I think it's a lot of mystery how we do the lactate testing and uh, no one is really understanding it completely. And that even includes me. So we do, uh, yeah, I understand the numbers, I understand how I'm feeling, but sometimes uh, Olav is saying, something that doesn't really make sense to me. But then uh, we do one more test and it's like, yeah, it was correct. So uh, the, the lactate testing is so advanced that, yeah. I'm and basically what it's doing, it's telling you where your certain thresholds are, like how much you're dipping into your glycogen stores, yeah. like how, you know, are you training your aerobic engine? Are you tipping into your anaerobic? Like, what are you learning about that that then impacts like the kind of sessions that you're doing? Well, it's quite complex. So uh, the whole idea is to 
just maximize so to have your engine and so you can really maximize your engine for the distance you're racing. So for example, when we have a preparing for a short distance race, then we want to have like a different like that response uh, for the energy yeah, or where we're getting the energy from. And uh, uh, so sometimes you do want to have like a, a quicker like that production, for example, for a shorter distance of racing. And when you go into a longer distance, then you want to have the opposite. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on where your metabolic profile is. Right. And you guys are very different athletes, right? And I'm sure your training is very personalized to your specific... Yeah. So like, we, uh, in general, we trend opposite directions. So if we just train exactly the same, I would trend... Uh, uh, more and more explosive, but Christian will trend slightly different direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have to do some uh, some adjustment in the training plan. So we do some uh, yeah small metabolic um, tests to see where we're at. Because uh, yeah, we have like this um, yeah period of uh, really specialization into the race. Mm -hmm. So the last bit of uh, preparation going into Kona, Olaf said, uh, yeah, you Gustav, we need to put a bit more threshold training into this program now because your your trend is uh, not where we want it to be. So we have to do slightly difference. So it's not that we're training like a different program, but it's more instead of the last 10 minutes of a threshold session, I might go longer, like twice the distance, but Christian might go harder mm -hmm. to like balance out the different... Uh, Right. You have you you're more of like a top end guy. Christian, you have this huge anaerobic capacity, but that means that you have to learn how to back off, right? Because you can dip into that and go too deep too too soon. No, I think more opposite. Like uh I got that all wrong. Um, <laughs> even though I look <laughs> even though I look very muscular and like strong, uh -huh. uh, uh, I do miss that top end power. So I really need to do those surges in training. So while, while he naturally had that top end speed and he can do that final K super fast in training, mm -hmm. but that's going to be more costly for him than right. for me. He'll need more really, recovery. Really sprinting that final K. So uh, often how we like uh, do our session differently into a big race is that I can do more high intensity. Uh -huh. And he has to be... But I might do right. a long threshold session instead. Right, right, right. And, and that's also why I can race back to back to back uh -huh. uh, short distance races because the stimulus I'm getting from the race is almost just a positive uh, stimulus for next weekend mm -hmm. while you will then be yeah. producing more and more lactate. Yeah. So I'm an ex explosive beast towards the end. Right. So you have a higher, you have a crazy VO2 max, Gustav, right? Yeah, it's we like both have, or uh, yeah, above 90 at our, our peaks. Right. But right now I'm, I'm certain I'm pretty low. So the... Um, yeah, it costs a lot to have a high VO2 max and to do an Ironman, you want to be as efficient as possible. Mm -hmm. So we now basically at our lowest VO2 max, I think in a few years because of the general training we've been doing. So now it's a challenge to try to- You got to get it back up To now. get it back up and um, get it to the standard of the Olympic distance racing. Right. And you, Christian, like you, 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 you're sort of like Michael Phelps. Like you don't produce lactate, right? <laughs> it's so <laughs> annoying sometimes. <laughs> I, uh, I like have to slow down, slow down, slow uh -huh. down. In altitude training, especially, we train in uh, Sierra Nevada in Spain, two thousand three hundred meters above sea level. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is, is in feet. It's like, like eight thousand five, isn't it? Yeah, eight thousand five yeah. feet. And uh, yeah, feel like I'm jogging at threshold. And I still have two high lactate, so just have to slow down. And then I see right. Christian, oh, you you need you have to increase. <laughs> You're running too slow. Right. And uh, even though it's the it's the right stimulus, I need to run slower because that is the best way for me to perform. You feel so shit mm -hmm. when you when you're training at uh, a speed slower than my arm and pace. So um, yeah, it's uh, it can be a bit annoying sometimes seeing his right because uh, conversely, like Christian, like <laughs> altitude doesn't really affect you, right? But you then you also don't get that hemoglobin boost but from that. I do get stimulus. a good stimulus, but I think it's more down to that I have such big lungs. So at threshold <laughs> uh -huh. work, I can I'm just I still have enough oxygen for the the workload or like to to stay to keep the pace high. Uh, yeah, so it's, yeah, especially when we do bike intervals, then we start at, yeah, 3,000 feet. 
mm. and uh, work our way up. Mm-hmm. And I feel so good in the start. Right. Like now it's a lot of oxygen. I'm ready to push, low lactate. And then we come like halfway up the mountain and I see Christian like just increasing the power and I'm just struggling more and more. So it can be a bit annoying to train with sometimes with his lactate response. But uh, yeah, I know yeah. it's the best for me. So it helps, but yeah. There, there I'm opposite because if we are riding down from Sierra Nevada, then it's tend to be like 25 degrees. So it's significantly warmer than it's up in Sierra Nevada. So I'm more feeling the heat is slowing me down. Mm-hmm. And then the, the higher up I climb, like up to... Uh, maybe 1700, 2000 meter. That's where like the fresh air is coming. So when he's starting to feel a lack of oxygen, then I'm more feeling the bonus of having fresh, right. cold air. So I can just <laughs> accelerate. What's interesting about that is it's got to it's gotta keep the training because you guys do all your training together fresh. Like you're very different, right? So it's not like if you were equally matched in your strengths and weaknesses, you guys might burn out like having to train with each other every single day, but understanding that you operate differently, you can still, you know, have that camaraderie because it's not like, uh, I don't know, like you're not, you don't, you're not like racing each other every single day. No, 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 no. So, uh, I, we like to like win every single session, but to win a session is not that you go the fastest the last 400 meters, except if, we have like a race prep session and the point is to go as fast as you can mm-hmm. the last 400 meters. It's more that you want to hit the optimal numbers all the time. You want to to have the best- uh, Execute on yeah, the intention yeah, the of the workout. Execution, yeah. yeah. So uh, I think that's where we're excelling the most as well because uh, we have a deeper understanding of what we're doing and why we're doing the session. And if you know why you're doing a session, you understand uh, more the change you can do yourself. So uh, if someone just tells you run 10 times 1K and you don't understand why you're doing it, you would just mm-hmm. go out and do 10 times 1K. But if you have an understanding of what pace you should be running at and what the uh, optimal execution is, then you can, for example, uh, run yeah, progressive or the last bit even faster, or yeah, you can change up the session according to what your daily need is. So I think uh, that's where we are really, really good. Yeah. And what is the partnership with Olav like? Like, does he say, here's what we're doing and then you do it? Or is it more a dialogue where you're like, okay, here's how I'm feeling today. Like, is there a discussion about it? Is there ever pushback when he says, I want you to do this? And you're like, no, I don't think I should be doing that today. Or sometimes just whatever he says you do. Yeah, so uh, he can say, uh, we, we should do this. And then me and Christian, will come with a suggestion, no, we want this. And then he says why we shouldn't do it oh. and explains we, why we are wrong. <laughs> or, or okay. but then you have to take the consequences yeah. of that. Yeah, so yeah. it's all about consequences. <laughs> so we can say, uh, yeah, we, we need to swim a bit harder because in the swim, we'll be lacking a bit. And mm-hmm. me and Christian both thinks that uh, we need to change the swim program a bit and do a bit shorter and more intensity swim sessions in the pool. And it's like, yeah, you can do that, but here's the consequences. Mm. And uh, we we do a lot of discussion and Olav is a great teacher. So we we learn why we're wrong. Right. But we also plan, or he plans like probably six months yeah. in advance. <laughs> uh, but then also like we change maybe, and then you have like the three weeks plan. Then you can also change like the last three, four days. We always like have like a, bigger picture, but we can also change very quickly the sessions. So if we, within the next week, see that uh, we are where we want to be in terms of VO2 max, right. then we are not just keeping up the program and trying to improve the VO2 max just because that's a plan. Mm-hmm. But then we can change the focus and work on our limitation for the next race. Right. But since they plan so much in advance, we can come to a training session and he have no idea what we're doing. Like he, he planned everything. He knows why we're doing it. He knows uh, like the details when he's planning it. But when we come to the training session, it's like, I can't remember why I wrote this, but it must be a reason behind it. Uh-huh. We, we, we have, then have to tell him the program when he's at the pool. Like, <laughs> then, okay, today we have the 400 with non, 90 seconds rest. And then uh-huh. it takes like maybe one minute. He has to like scan his whole brain. And then he comes up, uh, he remembers why we're doing it. And right. then we can uh, do the session. Got it. Or he can change it. Yeah. 
No, I'm not agree with myself. <laughs> two weeks ago, <laughs> let's change it. Yeah, two weeks ago, me was stupid. Oh, now let's change to 400 meters instead. Yeah, um, Christian, if you if you pull up the sleeve on your left arm, you can see the uh, continuous glucose monitor that you have there. Um, do you wear one as well? Yep. I'm interested. You got sweater. so are you both with Super Sapiens on that? Yeah. Um, what have you learned from using that in terms of you know how you're managing glucose and how that impacts? Um, your daily nutrition and also race nutrition. Yeah, so uh, for me, the biggest learning was that sometimes in uh, especially altitude training, I could get really, really tired and borderline sick. And it usually happened, yeah, twice every altitude camp. Mm -hmm. And then I noticed uh, throughout the night before I got tired, I had basically low sugar levels through the whole night and just trying to be more aware of the continuous eating. And even if a rest day, try to stay on top of the nutrition and eat more. Mm -hmm. So I... Does it impact the type of foods that you eat? And uh, not that... really. And I was, I was surprised actually, because you think that uh, drinking Coke or yeah, sugary product that you would spike. But for me, I spike the same if I eat bread or like slow releasing carbohydrates and everything. So it's... Uh, yeah, for me, it's only the mornings. I have like an insane spike in the morning, no matter what I eat. Mm -hmm. But what I haven't changed. I haven't changed my breakfast or anything. I just see see what the number give me and much yeah. the same. Like, and I think the most important is like you're learning to really feel quickly after the session. So you're always like on top of your nutrition. So uh, because if not, it's easy to go like forty to sixty minutes after a tough run session before you're getting your. Some, something to eat, mm -hmm. but when you're aware of your glucose level, it's easy to be kind of planning and then uh, having a routine. So you're always having like calories on board. Right. So monitoring that, does that spill over into how you're fueling throughout a race? Uh, fueling throughout a race is pretty simple. It's uh, get as much, much in as you can tolerate. So um, we're working with uh, Morten, right. a Swedish uh, company. And uh, that has allowed us to basically go way, way, way higher in the carbs than what is normally considered uh, okay for the stomach. So uh, I think using Super Sapiens could be helpful, but it's basically just do as much as you can tolerate mm -hmm. for us. And even there, we're doing some samplings where we are... So because of the special types of carbohydrates that's in the Morton, uh, Olav and the Morton team can, uh, based on their breath, analyze how many grams we are able to take up when you are riding. Based on your breath. Yeah. yeah. And then by looking at the, uh, the view to master or the oxygen intake we're using and the power, they can then calculate how sustainable this is. Mm. So, so you know for Ironman, uh, it's easy to do 350 watts for a given period of time. Mm -hmm. But when you then have to do it for, uh, or 300 watts for like four hours and then run after it, then uh, uh, at one point you will most likely just bunk. But but based on this, like you can calculate and see like how far you can get and how much power you can produce without right. uh, uh, ending up in the basement. Right, yeah, there is something specific about what Morton is doing that is really helpful in terms of, of staving off the GI distress that you see, particularly in humid places like Kona. Yeah, so yeah. they have uh, this technology that doesn't, uh, the carbs don't get absorbed as early as other products. So it, that it, it is basically encapsulated in uh, hydrogel. So it goes longer or deeper into the, into the system before you take it up. So it, you don't have the same stress in the stomach. Right. But saying that also before one of the big sessions I had before Kona, I felt fine and we went running. It was a brick session and we came maybe, yeah, 10K into the run. And I just vomited everything I had in my stomach. And I don't know if it was the Morton or the heat or what it was, but at, at that point I was a bit stressed for the race right. because, uh, yeah, under two weeks out and vomiting is not optimal when you're, <laughs> when no. you're racing. So um, still with the best product in the world, you can do things wrong. 
and uh, I was lucky I didn't, didn't, didn't happen to rain. Didn't you just have a coke? Yeah, but I, I really felt like I felt it coming, okay. mm. and uh, I tried to uh, just have some different taste in my mouth and just drink something different. So I felt like okay, now I'm gonna puke. Yeah, took like the smallest sip of coke, and there just everything came up. That's scary. Also, I'm sure being a student of the sport and knowing that many a great champion has been felled by that very thing. Like Maka talks about it all the time. It took him years to figure out like how to not have GI distress just so he could like run the way that he had trained to run to win the race. Yeah, but we are, uh, we're kind of lucky both of us because we can handle a great amount in training, but also in a day-to-day life, just uh-huh. eating a lot. So, But figuring that out, there was a very scientific approach that I, I can't wait to talk to Olaf about. I mean, I know that you would drink water that was laced with isotopes to try <laughs> to figure out your, you know, what, not just like how much glycogen you should be taking in, but, you know, whether or not the glycogen you were burning was from your glycogen stores versus the foods that you were eating, like getting really data-driven about the specifics of that to kind of dial in what that nutrition plan should be. Yeah, that was more to find out what our actual uh, consumption of or, like or figuring to out to see the yeah. whole budget you can train yeah. because if because with the the water that we drank and then later on peed on every morning, uh-huh. you could see then how many calories we could burn through over like two weeks period of time without losing weight, and then we really tried to do as much training as possible, and based on these numbers, then Olaf can then. In his training plan, he can see that, okay, if you do this amount or this so long bike ride with this power, then you're going to burn through so many calories. Mm -hmm. And if we do this every day, then you will be burned out because Mm -hmm. you can't eat enough. So it's more for him to have this uh, budget of how much he can actually give us in training. Right. So we have a lot of people with us, or more before, but we had a lot of people joining us for training camps. And uh, we call it the 10-day crack. So a lot of people can train a lot for a week without feeling uh, burnt out. But after about 10 days, then you, when you're training too much every day and you're eating too little and just like fading slowly every day, you won't notice until it's been mm-hmm. overdue. And at 10 right. days, most people would crack and either get uh, injured or sick or just tired in bed. So it's uh, it's definitely a real thing to see how much you're eating and try to compensate. One of the things I noticed watching you guys race the other day was just how frequently you would look at your watch, right? And I was like, "What are I want to know what the data fields are on on your whatever I don't know if it's, it's a Garmin or whatever watch you were wearing. Like, are you just looking at heart rate, pace, you know, on the bike, watts?" Is this also a reflection of, of your continuous glucose monitor? Like what were the data points that you were most interested in staying on top of? Uh, for the run for me, it's, it's a comfort thing, I think. So I feel like I was running slower and slower. So to just have the number of the pace uh, that I was actually running uh, mm-hmm. my prescribed pace, that was, uh, so it, it's not OCD, but it's a comfort thing. To, uh, to get confirmation, okay, you're mm-hmm. on track, you're on track, you're on track. And what else are you supposed to do out there? It's, uh, if you entertain <laughs> yourself with looking at the distance, it's just increasing towards the marathon. Yeah, so I looked also at the time, just counting down, okay, now it's about 20 more minutes and mm. I can do this. So just pace, distance, the basics. Yeah, mostly for me and run, it's basically only pace, yeah. Mm-hmm. And what about you? I Christian? have heart rate, total time for the run, uh, pace and distance. Uh-huh. So using those four and just yeah, entertaining myself and making sure that the heart rate doesn't spike. Right. Like if you suddenly have a crazy spike and it's super hot out, you can't come back from that, which kind of gets into core body temp uh, stuff, which obviously is hugely important. Once you kind of tip over a certain core body temp, uh, you're in big trouble, right? So talk a little bit about the work that you guys have put into maintaining a lower core body temp throughout the day in hot locations. Yeah, so it's not uh, trying to maintain as low core body temp as possible. Or just trying to it's not more, let it's it. It's more to tolerate mm. the, the, uh, the body temperature. But I was looking at, the, at my watch and on the bike and I was surprised actually how low it was. I guess it was lower temperature that day as well. 
But in training, I've been pushing way above 39 degrees at the warmest days. And uh, so, so how are you measuring core body temp? Like you have you you have something inside you that's syncing up with your watch, telling uh, you what yeah, your usually, core body temp or is, be- or is this secret <laughs> proprietary? No, before <laughs> we had to uh, to put the pill inside, uh-huh. and uh, the normal way to do it was to to swallow it. But the issue there is you don't know exactly where the the temperature pill is, mm-hmm. and also if you drink cold water, you would affect the measurements. So to be more precise, we had to. Uh, put it in the other end. Mm. And that became a bit of a- Suppository. Yeah, it became a bit of a, a hassle after some time because we have to use, yeah, single use pills, obviously. And um, just download the data, no la- live feed or anything. So uh, we got in contra- contact with a Swiss company that's called Core. And it's a device you put on the heart rate monitor instead. Ah. And we have been helping them develop their algorithms and uh, yeah. So that's so interesting. We just so you like are this. getting a live feedback yeah. on your watch. Yeah. You know what your core body temp is and you also know the specific point at which if you tip over it, you're gonna be in trouble, right? But with that knowledge, how does that um, translate into the, like gauging your effort? It's a little bit the same with the heart rate. Like uh, if it's constantly increasing, then you yeah. know that you are in a bath or bad, bad uh, pattern or bad, mm-hmm. bad way. So uh, you just want to keep it like steady. And if you're increasing the pace, it's okay if it's the core temperature is increasing too. But if you're suddenly uh, riding at the same power and you're just gradually going, going uh, higher and higher, then you know that you will soon hit the wall. So it's more, you're looking at the numbers combined mm-hmm. together and not just one single number. Right. And what's really interesting that I learned from uh, using the core is that you don't feel warm when you're warm you feel warm when the temperature is increasing. So you can go from 37 to 38 and feel really warm at 38 because the temperature is rising so rapidly. But you can go also from 39.5 down to 39.3 and feel freezing Mm. because the temperature is going down. So with that knowledge on the uh, the run, you can look at the watch and see, okay, are you actually warm now or just slight increase in temperature feeling warm? Mm. So you can be more... Yeah, have more data points than trusting the feeling because temperature is a really strange thing. You can, like this water is almost room temperature, but it feels cold because the energy transfer is higher, but the air doesn't feel cold at all. Right. So it's, uh, temperature is really, really hard to get like feeling of from the human body. That's super interesting. Yeah, not intuitive then. Yeah. At all. So to have the the core monitor on just like at the side of the body instead of using the pills every day, it's, uh, it's a good thing for us. Right. Um, at some point in the race, like all of this stuff is is instructive and informative when you're out on the race course and you're, you know, four hours into an eight hour day or whatever it is. Um, but at some point, you know, the rubber meets the road and you're racing, right? You have to adapt. You got to react to, you know, what's happening out on the course and and kind of just say, fuck it, right? Like when you're in the hole, Christian, and you're like, all right, Gustav's making a move, like all that shit goes out the window, right? Because you got you to bust it. So how do you make those decisions or, um, you know, kind of balance all of the data with like, I'm an athlete in the middle of a race trying to win? I I think you need to, so so you have your numbers like in your data bank, but then when you're on on the race course, you have your kind of uh, your upper limit numbers that you know that you can do, but Mm -hmm. just for a short period of time. So for for example, on the bike, it's not like you're just going out at your, steady arm and power. Like when someone is surging, then you try to follow and, and you're looking around and seeing how the feel is responding and then hoping that the pace will slow down later uh-huh. on. And uh, so sometimes the bar can be like 30 watts higher, but then you hope that it's the same consequences for everyone and everyone will have to do it and then run slower. Right. Run. Yeah, so you constantly have to evaluate and I think having the data points in our training really gives us more information. So, uh, but with more information, you also have to do even more choices because, uh, yeah, you know the consequences of everything. Mm-hmm. So I could ride 400 watts for, yeah, a shorter period of time, 
but uh, you know what's on the other side of that. Yeah, I know what's yeah. on the other side, and I know right. how like much you got, you energy got this use. bank, right? Yeah. And you can, you know, you can make certain withdrawals. But yeah. if you make too many, with you know, oh, that extra withdrawal, if I do that, yeah. this is going to happen. So yeah. you just have to take calculated risks yeah. and know the, the the consequences of those decisions. Yeah, yeah, and you just have to hope you have a bigger bank, right? Yeah, even like rest. up to Harvey, halfway through. Uh, yeah. on the bike course we were, uh, had a huge surge yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah like uh yeah 370 watts for like 10 minutes wow in the middle of the race just to bridge up to the guys three guys up front uh -huh. it was just before sam Lelo was breaking away and i had gustav like on my wheel or i had like to 12, catch up to you before that as well yeah, so 12 I had meters a, behind i had <laughs> like 30 minutes there with way above race pace and, and uh -huh. then i thought okay this is hurting so badly it's above threshold uh, and uh, I just hope that this will hurt Gustav more than me. Uh -huh. And if I can make it up to the guys up front without him, then I can get an easier travel back to Kona. Right. And then maybe have four minutes on him. Yeah. So much but, for working together. Yeah. You were trying to put distance <laughs> on him all the way back then. <laughs> yeah, and I, I saw this and I was like, this is the move. Or like, this is uh, like the, yeah. So yeah, uh, none of the commentators said anything about that. Like, no, I that think it's, it's hard to see from the yeah. outside, but I just saw Christian in front and I knew that if he caught up with the front group and I didn't catch up with him, that I would have a really, really hard time getting back mm. because I was uh, alone at that time. Uh, we had just um, broken away from our group. And uh, yeah, I just saw that this was like, yeah, if I don't make this, the race is over. It's done. Yeah. Right. So I really had to go way above race pace to, to make but it happen. But you know you got that downhill after the turnaround. The, yeah, but the downhill is still hard. That. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's even though you're not drafting downhill, when you have that many athletes and a motorcycle, it's a huge mm -hmm. boost being behind. But it's still, you still have to work for it. For right. sure. There was a lot of speculation about what was going on inside your your jersey on the bike. Like, yeah. what did you have stuffed in there? Like, everyone's <laughs> like, "What is that? Is he trying to cool his core body temp? Did you just have bottles oh, in there? It, or just, what was it was that? a bit random, actually. So. Uh, we tried it in a wind tunnel earlier this year, and it's uh, mm -hmm. basically no aero penalty. It's slightly faster in crosswind, but it's not, not really any difference. But the thing is, uh, I had a bottle in transition one, and usually we have this box in transition with our bikes where you can throw away your things. And I, yeah, I just didn't think it through. So when I came to the bike, I went to like throw away the bottle, but there was nothing there because Ironman transitions is they're different mm -hmm. than the normal ones. And I knew if I just throw away the bottle, then I would get a penalty. So first I had it in my pocket in a rear, but it almost fell out. So then I thought, hmm, maybe I should just put it in my jersey and uh, make like a story out of it. And uh. Uh, people will repeat it in the future for like aero gains. But it's, uh, yeah, it was not really about the gains. It was not getting a penalty. Interesting, yeah. It was like, is this shape in here making yeah. it more aerodynamic? <laughs> He's trying to look but, more like me. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, the barrel <laughs> chest. <laughs> Inspiration. The barrel chest. Yeah. Um, well, the aerodynamic stuff is super interesting too. I mean, most people are familiar with cyclists going into the wind tunnel or time trialists trying to really dial in that aerodynamic position. But once again, you guys have gone next level. You did all this testing on a track with what's it called? Like body rocket? Body rocket, yeah. So what was going on there that you know elevated your understanding of, of being optimally aerodynamic? So currently... Oh, so we spent a lot of days in the winter on this uh, winter just to be able to dial in the position on the bike. But the problem there is that the feeling you have in the wind tunnel isn't necessarily the way of riding outside. And uh, especially me, when I'm riding, I'm changing position quite a lot and uh, been moving the saddle a couple of centimeters back and forth. Mm. <laughs> like During the ride? No, no, no. Like, uh, or over, just experimenting. Like experimenting over like a training camp. Yeah, Christian is insane. So, it's like, yeah, he can go one session and then, no, I don't have any power. Let's go up with the saddle four centimeters. Mm. No, it's no, not no. even millimeters. It's like, uh, okay, I'm going to raise my, my saddle so much right now. <laughs> or I think I need to go <laughs> down. And I go down and no, I have to go up. So, uh -huh. uh, so Constantly it's more moving like, around. Uh, it's been tricky to find the body position. No, um, yeah, position on the bike. Um, but body rocket is like trying to bring what you do in the wind tunnel out in the field. So it has like sensors underneath your 
aero bars, like a, a small sensor there, and also underneath your saddle and in your pedals. So in, by this way, you are separating your body from the bike. So mm -hmm. when you're out riding, you can measure all the wind that's coming to your body. And you can measure where on the bike the, you are getting the, the forces. So for example, see that you're not really aerodynamic in your mm. front of your, like with your arms or if it's your lower back or where the CDA numbers is increasing. That's some Formula One shit. <laughs> That's like yeah. next level. But the vectors that you got to factor in are not just aerodynamics, but comfort. You're going to be on the bike for four plus hours and power, right? Power transfer. So any, you know, it's like, yeah, you can get super aerodynamic, but if that's not translating into watts, or if you're so uncomfortable that you're gonna cramp or you're just not gonna be able to sustain it, that's not gonna work either. Yes, yeah, so you need to have a good balance between the hamstring use and the quad use as well. Uh -huh. so, uh, because of, you, you do have to go out and run the marathon after it. So it's not just uh, about getting as fast as possible on the bike. Right. And your, your positions are very different. What's interesting, Christian, like also your bikes are different. You have a very unique bike, Christian. I don't know what's going on with that bike. And, a, and kind of a, a weird, odd position. Like you're much more upright and your arms are, you know, like up high as well. So how did that, how did you arrive upon I that? Feel, I feel I haven't arrived yet to necessarily where I want mm. to be. It's been like a long uh, process of uh, getting there, but the, uh, yeah, it's just the fact that I want to keep my power high and not just because if I go too low and I feel my stomach and chest goes into the knees and then I'm losing power. Mm -hmm. So it's more being able to still think about the run after the bike while Gustav is maybe more flexible. And mm. Yeah, and uh, I feel like I'm a natural cyclist and my cycle or my bike position is quite similar to that of uh, like time trial specialist in mm -hmm. in the Tour de France. So I have more like a traditional bike position. Yeah. 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 And that's just through rigorous testing. You've figured this yeah, out. Yeah, and also comfort. Yeah. yeah. And what feel natural. I, we, we've been to the, or been to the winter myself as well. And we did just minor changes. It was mm -hmm. basically no changes because uh, for me, I knew that my position was quite fast based on power numbers and... Uh, the analysis we've done before. So we just had like slight increase in angle of the arms and um, yeah, right. small optimization. Right. Um, how are you guys feeling about the fact that uh, Fredino didn't race? Is he uh, on your mind? Is the mono imano against Jan yeah. looming in the future? And how are you thinking about that rivalry? Of course, I have both the Hawaii race still to win and I've never raced against Jan. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will see what's happening in the future. You only have That's one. a very pol politically correct answer. <laughs> I think, I think he, Come on, man. You're not afraid to trash talk a little bit. You only have one more year, <laughs> I think. So yeah. one more Kona. So we He's will an see, old man. <laughs> see what's happening next year. <laughs> but it's three, it's three weeks between the grand final and Hawaii uh -huh. next year. So it's going to be a quick turnaround. Gustav? Uh, I, I don't feel like I'm driven, driven the same way with rivalry as Christian am. I, yeah, I want to win, but, uh, and I want to beat the best, but I don't have like this particular guys that I want to beat. I just want to beat everyone. Mm. So I don't have the need to beat Jan to feel better but, about myself. But I feel it would be cool to race against him. Like he's yeah, been for sure. Sure. Yeah. the best in the sport since 2008 and yeah, been over a decade on top of the sport and really changed long distance triathlon. So just to take that opportunity to race him, I think is something. Uh, yeah, I had opportunity in uh, California last year, but then we had this insane storm coming in for Ironman and the race was canceled in race morning. So mm -hmm. yeah, we went on the same start line, but never got the race. Right. Uh, so Jan was the first to become an Olympic gold medalist and then win at Kona, but it took him seven years to do it and two Konas. I think I have that correct. Uh, you guys, you Christian, you won the Olympic gold and then won St. George, which is technically the world championship, but with this asterisk because it wasn't Kona and Kona has this mystique and all of that. Um, so yes, there's still a little unfinished business there for you and he is the GOAT. 
Um, but he's, you know, he's getting, he's getting up there in years. Um, I would love to see that race. And I hope that it, I hope that it transpires. We'd all like to see that, I think, but it leaves me wondering about, um, you know, other heroes that you might have. Like, do you look at other sports and who are the people that you look to for inspiration? Or maybe you don't, maybe you're just like, I'm good, man. I'm, I'm the champ. Uh, I don't think like we uh, uh, it's not that we don't have uh, too many idols in other sport, but I think we just uh, find inspiration in the work we do and the conversation we have in the team. I know, yeah, me and Christian, we don't have any. You don't have posters on your wall of uh, no. this guy or that guy. No. Uh-uh. So it's uh, yeah, I don't know why, but I don't have like any huge sporting heroes. Mm. Well, when I started like uh, seeing like short distance triathlon on TV like ten years ago, then it was the era of Javier Gomez and mm-hmm. Alistair and Johnny and how they were changing the sport. So I guess I was back then looking up to like how they were dominating the race and really racing attractively, uh, attacking from the start and just like being in the front seat. And I think that has maybe been more my inspiration in triathlon more than long distance really because yeah. we've always had like the dream towards the olympics rather than ironman actually so uh, it's more like the short distance athletes that has been my inspiration mm-hmm. no no like no like heroes in football the bergen team's terrible though right <laughs> <laughs> yeah we we don't talk about the <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about them. But yeah, I was I, reading. I, yeah, I grew up as a cyclist, so uh, yeah. obviously Tor Hustad mm. uh, was a huge inspiration. Right, back then, but the I, sprinter. I, yeah, um, I was reading Brad Culp's article, the Red Bull article that he went and visited uh, you, Christian, in in, in Bergen, um, and was talking about this confidence that people from Bergen have that is different from the typical kind of Norwegian humility. And I feel like you guys both have that, like you're humble and you're grounded, but you also have this quiet confidence about you. We have the saying that we are not from Norway, we're from Bergen. So I think it's like that self-belief and uh, uh, inner self from Bergen. Yeah. Um, can we talk about the sub seven thing for a couple minutes? Yes. You want to? <laughs> I'm going to head out. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just for yeah. a minute. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it's super fascinating for people that don't know, much like that uh, sub two project where Kipchoge tried to break two hours in the marathon. Similarly, there was a, an, an, uh, uh, a project whereby you would be able through aid to try to eclipse the seven hour barrier in the Ironman. You did that, would you go like 644 or something like that? Yeah. Six, something like that. Yeah, six forty four. Where you were getting pulled by, you know, a peloton of cyclists and paced on the run and all kinds of stuff. Um, it feels like a stunt. And I know that wasn't this was not like a focus of your program by any stretch of the imagination, but I feel like it's something that gets people who aren't necessarily fans of triathlon excited about triathlon because it's something we can all kind of wrap our heads around. So I'm wondering, are you gonna take another stab at that? Because I think there's a lot. I think I think six thirty is well within range with yeah. the right team and support. Yeah, it was a really fun project to be a, to be a part of. Like we had ten guys we could use however we wanted, like across swim, bike, and run. And we ended up with one on the swim, eight on the bike, and one on the run. And uh, it ended up being more actually a race between my team and Joel Skipper's team, mm-hmm. and just making the cut under seven hours. Right. So uh, it was a really cool project, both to my like for the training for myself to get physically fit enough to do it, but also like the whole build up with the team and organizing with the pacers and uh, the whole almost like team feeling of going into it. Right, so many people come into play to and really pull that off. And it's like it, an it's like a it's like a ballet almost of and people coming that, in and out. Both for Olav and Adam and Matt Portrilla had like a lot of tough weeks of uh, getting it organized Planning. and getting the yeah. team trained together and dialed in. And uh, uh, it's nice to look back and see that we actually did beat the other guys and also got sub seven. So uh, uh, great. Uh, 
experience. But any plans to do it again? Uh, not in the first few years. Yeah. Like the schedule now not for a while for going into Paris is so busy. Uh -huh. Like uh, the turnaround now to go back to short distance is maybe more or higher prioritized than trying right. to do something similar. Uh, having spent all this time at all these races, you just got back from Kona. You're, you know, one of the unique things about triathlon is that you race with the amateurs. Like you go to these huge races, but there's, you know, most of the people there are average Joes and Janes. What are the colossal fails and, and tragic mistakes that you see amateurs making? Like where you're just like, you're out training, you know, a couple of days before the race and you see people out there and you go back to your condo and you're like, can you believe that guy? What is it? What are these people doing? <laughs> I think uh, what's unique about triathlon is that everyone has so much knowledge about training and they are really, uh, yeah, they have a lot of knowledge, but it just comes down to execution and uh, just quality of training, I think. So uh, they might know like all the values for their LT2 and those things. But yeah, still they don't train as much, I guess. And uh, not training yeah. enough. Like, yeah, or, I don't I, know. It depends. Like if, if you it, have a normal job. I mean, most people it, yeah. can't yeah, train yeah, that much. Course. So that's sort yeah. of out of their hands. But yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of like simple things that you see people doing where they're like, that guy's got it all wrong. Or like, you know, race like seriously, yeah. dude. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. Like out there, a lot, a lot of people, out there doing uh, intervals like two days before the race. Or a lot whatever. of people just, uh, they have a really good plan on the bike for a training session before. And then they see me and Christian riding past and their plan. The ego goes out the window kicks in. and they just have to follow, 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 mm -hmm. put, out, put out their phone, ride past us and take a selfie and then yeah. let down. I don't uh, think that's the smartest move, but uh, I think most triathletes are training, yeah, training good. And it's hard to pinpoint exactly what they're doing wrong because I think most people are doing quite the right things mm. for me. Yeah. You definitely had media training. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, no, but honestly, <laughs> yeah. triathletes are, they are uh, uh, in the forefront. Yeah, in terms for of sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, triathlon's and... always been at the cutting edge of like science because they're tinkerers and they're willing to you yeah. know, try new things that perhaps professional cyclists or professional yeah. runners, you know, won't. And I think that's cool and unique about the sport. Um, but, you know, I am interested in, uh, perhaps you guys uh, conveying a little bit of wisdom about what you've learned over the many years that would be applicable to the average endurance athlete or endurance enthusiast, perhaps somebody who's out there contemplating their first marathon or their first Olympic triathlon, like where should their focus be placed and what types of things should they I, not worry about that maybe they spend too much time thinking what about? What I think sometimes is fun is to see how you can have amateurs being more professional uh -huh. uh, in terms of recovery than what we are. Like you do all the massage, you do the recovery booth, ice bath. But I think the most important thing of or factor is nutrition and, and enough sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they can just kind of throw out those hours they're using on their typical recovery thing and just getting more calories in and sleeping enough, I think that's really going to be beneficial. Yeah, and but then you don't get to buy the cool stuff. And, <laughs> you know, a lot of it is about the, the blingy yeah. stuff in yeah. triathlon too, I think. But then they can invest it in equipment instead, you know? Right. That's yeah. one, uh, yeah, level higher bike price. Mm. So for the recovery piece, what does that look like for you guys? I mean, sleep, obviously. Do you do uh, ice bath, sauna, Normatec boots, like all that kind of stuff. We do nothing. Yeah. You don't do any of that. We do no. nutrition, sleep, and uh, Intensity training. controlled, yeah. Yeah. I was watching um, uh, Lionel Sanders vlogs. You know? <laughs> and I guess, you know, he's he was staying at Chris Lieto's house. He's got yeah. an ice bath and they were like playing around with the ice bath and Lionel was like, I can't do it. I don't, I don't want any part of this. <laughs> but, but we don't do that either. Like, yeah. uh, especially preparing for a warm race like uh, uh, Kona, we wouldn't do ice bath like that. Yeah, well, it's interesting. And maybe this is a question for Olav, but so many of those recovery modalities, I often wonder, um, are they robbing the athlete of the adaptation to exercise induced stress that you're looking for? Like you want your body to have a response to the yeah. strain that you just yeah. put it through. And if you 
do too much recovery stuff, are you undermining like what you're actually trying to achieve? Yeah, we've seen that gains. with um, antioxidants in altitude. Right. So people take antioxidants because uh, they don't want to get the body inflamed and uh, yeah, health benefits. And it's good up to a certain amount, but if you do too much, you actually, yeah, as you just mentioned, you, you don't get all the benefits because you need some kind of inflammation or else you won't build back stronger. Mm -hmm. But I don't think uh, doing 50 minutes of massage is do, having any effect. If it's a comfort thing, it's a comfort thing, you can do it. But for me, I would never spend time to go out of bed to meet someone and have a massage. For me, it's better to just relax and watch YouTube or listen to a podcast or something. Mm. So just relax when I can and do, do that well. Yeah. Interesting. Same for you. Yes, we have the same program there. Yeah. Yeah. What do you guys? Uh, what do you? What do you do in your limited free time? I know. I know. We Christian likes much. to watch Dexter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he likes watch. You watch Dexter, right? <laughs> The yeah. psycho killer. He's your hero. <laughs> so there's, a, He's, there's a poster of him on your wall. <laughs> yeah, like uh, up in the ceiling. Yeah, it's all about obsession. <laughs> no, no, normally we squeeze in like a power nap, which like we're just like in bed and just recovering until the next session. Uh huh. So we. So I think if you see our daily work and how we do like how we spend our days, it can be very boring for a lot of people, and it's very simple. Like you swim back and run and uh, just with the meals in between and a power nap midday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a typical day for us in uh, altitude is waking up at uh, 7.30, go to the pool at like 8.15, swim for 90 minutes, go back, eat lunch, have a power nap. And a power nap for us is not the five minute standard. It's not the 10 minutes, mm -hmm. it's like more an hour midday, just sleeping. And then eat some more, have a bike ride, two, two and a half hours, three hours and then a short run, make dinner. So in Attitude or in Fondo Mobile, make the dinner ourselves every day. And th then we eat, then we have a, a conversation with Olav about the training the next day, and then we go to bed. Mm. So in that schedule, we don't have too much time yeah, to squeeze in uh, more than Dexter. But maybe, maybe you can ask him af afterwards if he can start like doing two by 30 minutes of massage on the yeah. new stuff. So where, where would you fit yeah. that in? It's well, the, mas the, the, the swan year comes to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you don't have to go it, anywhere. No, but that's as still, a cyclist. Yeah, I would think you'd be all in on that. Yeah, but cyclists only have uh, one session a day. You know, so it's easy to fit in in the afternoon. Slackers, or yeah, you call slackers. them slackers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like they train maybe the same amount of hours, but they have one session, five yeah. hours, concentrated. It's easier to use the the free time. But we have yeah, swimming takes a lot of time. It's always transportation, and you have to change. And yeah, swimming just takes a lot of time. But while cycling and running, you can always start from your house, basically. So, um, yeah, and also we have to figure out what we're going to train the next day. So mm -hmm. a lot of log logistics. And for us, we can say, when we finish swimming, okay, we're going to ride at two. And then we come closer to two and say, no, it's better to push it to one or to three. So to have an extra person like a, a masseuse into this whole picture to plan around, it's just adding to the stress. Too complicated. Yeah, so we yeah. like to have a flexible schedule and that's why we don't plan too much training with other people either. Yeah. So we just say, okay, we run in 10 minutes. So- uh, And are you guys yeah, roommates easy. throughout all of this? We no, we are. But yeah. Christian is a heavy breather during the night. <laughs> and I'm, my ears are actually sore now. I have like a bloody ear because- uh, You share the same bedroom? Now we do, yeah. Just for, just for four days here. No, okay. we, and we did in uh, two and a half weeks in, uh, yeah, we in did, Hawaii. That's true. Yeah. 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 So, no girlfriends. <laughs> so uh, I have- No girlfriends? No, 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 okay. no, no girlfriends. <laughs> okay. so, but I have to wear my AirPods in the air to just cancel out all the noise. <laughs> but it's it's getting a bit Those stressful Those lungs, man. Yeah. Too much uh, oxygen going through. I think you guys deserve it's not yeah, only have your own, your own bedrooms. Yeah, we usually at this have point, yeah, yeah. being super well, famous I mean, celebrities. It, it usually we have, but now it was a bit uh, uh -huh. with the logistics and uh, the Kona and here. So it's sometimes yeah. we have to share, but it's okay for a shorter period. But now I feel like it's been a <laughs> bit too long. So it's going right. to be good to have my own bedroom. Uh, final thing, and then I'll let you guys go. And uh, I'm, I'm just curious about mindset, like how you maintain your focus on, on these goals and, and stay plugged in 
when the going gets tough and, you know, I don't know, it's the middle of the winter and you're just, it's session, session, session. Like you are living a very monk-like existence in order to achieve these, you know, insane goals that you've set for yourself. How do you, you know, stay fresh with that and, um, and, and you know, goal oriented? Yeah, it's, uh, it's strange because I had the same goal for so many years to take the, to Tokyo Olympic gold. And uh, then after the race, I just felt like, was this it? Well, I have everything I've been working towards. Did I do enough and everything? And after that, I was a bit kind of empty for some time because I didn't have a, a bad performance. I came top 10 in my first Olympics and I was like happy with my performance in itself, but I didn't reach my goal, my long-term goal for, yeah, 10 years. And uh, after a week, I was just already on to the next one and uh, was Paris and uh, ready to, to go again. Mm -hmm. And I don't do anything particular with my, my motivation or anything. For me, it comes quite natural. So um, yeah, I don't know. No, like, <laughs> like sort of practices or mantras or techniques that you- Not deploy. really. And I don't watch any like triathlon videos to get myself motivated or have like motivational speeches or anything. For me, it, it comes from within and it's a natural thing. Mm -hmm. I guess Dexter. A lot of Dexter's your north, your north star. <laughs> it's just in the DNA. <laughs> watching you, like I'm very motivated by uh, races. So even though I had a very opposite experience with Tokyo, winning the goal or race that I was working towards for ten years, mm -hmm. basically straight after I was thinking about Hawaii. Like I really wanted to win Hawaii and. Back then, I first had to qualify before I got the wild card, and uh, uh, yeah, it's just yeah setting new targets. Mm -hmm. And if it goes wrong, like you know, in uh, Hawaii when I finished uh, third, then and then watching the pictures uh, when he's crossing the finish line first, and I just think that okay, in twelve months time, mm -hmm. and I do when they cross the finish line first yeah. again. So it's more- The fire's burning hot. When it's going well, you just want to repeat it again. When it's going not that well, then it's even more like a slap in the face and okay, wake up and uh, try to get back on track. Yeah. But it's easier to be motivated when you see Christian also motivated. And I guess it's the same for Christian for me. So we do feed off each other in that way. Right. And we don't spread like the, or sometimes we do. Sometimes like life is hard. You ever, there must be moments where you're <laughs> yeah. like, I'm sick of this guy. Like I need to, I need to hang out with someone else. Yeah, but Christian is uh, really direct in that way. He just puts on his uh, AirPods and I'm, I'm silent. And we can go training sessions, even though we train together, like we're not talking at all. Mm -hmm. And then we can have some training session. We're like talking for three hours straight. Right. So uh, even though we are like together, we give each other like the space. space. It, yeah. it's, it's not often I put in the AirPods though. No, but it, 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 it can be a, it can yeah, be a week. the signal, leave me alone. It can be a week straight, but it's not often. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's it's not, a, it, nece, it doesn't necessarily need to be a reason for it. It's just like the mood. That, okay, yeah. Now, yeah. And when you, when, you, when you do put the AirPods in and the training, are you listening to music or what do you, what do you listen to? It can be everything. Yeah. Sometimes just noise canceling on. Yeah. Oh, really? oh, wow. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah, but it's, uh, it's easier to... Uh, to train with someone when you know, like we are in this together, we have the same ambitions. We have to, yeah. And uh, also now going into to Kona, we looked at each other for as the biggest competitors. So uh, we had a training session. We had a lunch at the Four Seasons, mm -hmm. and the food was a bit too good, so we, we ate a bit too much. And then we came to the run in the afternoon, and uh, yeah, we both had a a bad day. But since we both like our biggest competitors. When I said, okay, I'm gonna stop it now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit the session, Christian said, okay, then I can stop as well. <laughs> but that yeah. was more as a joke though. Yeah, it was, a, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but still, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, that was, uh, so, so you went to toilet after the first interval <laughs> and I went out to the rocks and had to puke up the lunch. <laughs> so so that, that's what happened when I'm uh -huh. not in charge of the planning of the day, <laughs> yeah. putting yeah. on a run session straight after lunch. <laughs>
Yeah. So you you left a, a deposit of, uh, of 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 your own body on the lava fields there for Madame Pele to <laughs> contemplate. That's good karma. Yeah. Must be good karma. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, well, I have so much admiration and respect uh, for both of you guys. I'm a huge fan, and it was a delight watching you guys go head to head the other day. And I can't wait to see what you guys accomplish in the years to come. So. Uh, at your service, and it was just a delight to talk to you. So thank you. Thank Appreciate you so much. You guys. Thank you for having yeah. us. Yeah, I love this bromance. It's good. <laughs> I hope you guys stay together forever. <laughs> at some point, you're going to need girlfriends, but you know. <laughs> we're working on it. Yeah, we're working cool. so hard on it. <laughs> but the, the problem here again, Olav with his consequences. So he pulls uh, up like yeah. this. Um, the voice of God. Yeah, he pulls up this uh, statistics that the uh, yeah, athletes with girlfriends, they perform worse than <laughs> the ones without. So uh, always with the consequences. I don't it's think, up to you. Yeah, I know, but uh, I have the choice, but you have to know that if you go through with this, then uh, you Eight might- Eight months, you're done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, playing on consequences. All right. Well, yeah, you could put that, that data point in maybe after Paris. Yeah, we'll see. We'll okay. see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, come back and talk to me again, you guys. Super fun. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Peace. Lights.